Well, hello, friends. Welcome to Moments with Jesus for our Bible study time. And yes, I know we're transitioning from doing a live study to pre recorded. Um, it's just because I've had some other things come up. And so, you know how it is trying to balance things and. So anyway, I hope that all of you that have been watching and even our new friends who will come on to watch that you will continue to be blessed as we finish out this set of Bible studies together. And I'm referring to the It Is Written Bible studies. If you go to itiswritten.org, you can go to their store and get the lessons. They look like this. It's a set of over 20 lessons that we've been going through. And for this particular study, uh, this is lesson 19, where we are going to delve into the subject of the mark of the beast. And so I want to strongly caution, first of all, that if this is your first time looking at um, and studying um, this Bible study with us, this Bible study series, I strongly encourage you to go back through and start with lesson one and go through because when we study the Bible, the Bible always interprets itself. Every topic builds on top of another topic. And that is especially true for what we will study right now and for our next study as well. So if you'd like to find those previous studies, just go to our Moments with Jesus Facebook page. You can scroll down and see the previous videos that have been recorded. Or you can also go to our Moments with Jesus YouTube channel, and that information is on our Facebook page as well. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. And I do encourage you, if you haven't already, to get your Bibles and some note paper because you will want to be taking some notes for this study. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for the power of your word, because Father, it is your word that transforms us. And Lord Jesus, we are thanking you for everything that you have provided for our salvation. And that even now, even now Lord, we know that we never ever walk alone and we thank you for this. Holy Spirit, we ask you now to help us understand your word as we study, especially on this subject of the mark of the beast. Lord, I know there's so many different interpretations and uh, men's opinions about what this means, but Lord, we want to go to your word to hear one thing, and that is what do you say and what is important according to you for us to know. So Lord, help us to have our wills completely surrendered to you. And thank you, Father, that you never, ever leave us alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I hope you're ready to get started. So as we always do, I like to start with the opening story that's at the beginning of the lesson. And this one starts out by saying, Recovery experts sifting through the rubble following a major earthquake in Turkey in 1999 made a shocking discovery. Thousands of the buildings that collapsed in the Timbler were poorly constructed, and many lives might have been saved if these buildings had only been built according to code. External appearances gave no indications of problems with the buildings, but when the earth shook, it became painfully obvious that what appeared to be solid and stable was anything but. In the final days of earth's history, a time of trouble will shake the world. Only those who have built their faith according to the word of God are going to withstand the spiritual shaking that will take place. And friends, that's, you know, it's a very sobering thought um, that this story brings out, but it's, you know, a thought that should, at most, it what it should do is just drive us to realize how much we need Jesus and to realize that we want our faith to be built on Him, on His Word, what He says. 
And so as we go into this, I'd like to just go ahead and kind of set the table, so to speak, that on the subject of the mark of the beast, many times people, um, when they look at this subject, they look at it with trepidation, with fear. But we want to remember that God is not a God of fear. God wants us to be filled with His perfect peace and His perfect love. And that is true even in regards to this topic. And so while the phrase mark of the beast tends to get a lot of attention, we also want to remember there is another phrase in the Bible that actually is more important, and that is called the seal of the living God. And we're going to talk about that tonight, how in the end, what we all need to have and should desire to have is the seal of the living God. So I hope as we go through this, we're going to try to keep it as simple as possible, but yet we want everything to be based on what the Bible says. So we're just going to kind of methodically go through these questions and verses and let the Holy Spirit reveal to us uh, what is important for us to know in regards to our relationship with Jesus. So question one. What did the prophet Daniel see happening on planet Earth at the end of time? Well, let's go to the book of Daniel, Daniel 12, verse 1. So as we always do, we want to have our Bibles close by, and we want to be um, looking and hearing for ourselves what the Bible says. So in Daniel 12, verse 1, the Bible says, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Now that's reading part of that verse. And so we see here that the closing chapter of the book of Daniel opens up with letting us know that in the days right before Jesus comes, there is going to be a time of trouble upon this earth. And the lesson here says, a final great conflict is set to engulf the earth, preparing the way for the enforcement of the mark of the beast. And you might be thinking, well, why would this be happening? What is going on? Well, let's remember, as we come closer to the, to the end of earth's history, as we know it, you know, Jesus has an arch enemy named Satan, and Satan is warring against Jesus' children. And because Satan himself knows that his time is short to try to deceive people and try to pull as many people to his side as he can, because he knows his time is short, he is setting up things to create a huge deception that will encompass the whole earth. And that's what the book of Daniel is referring to here is this time of trouble. In other words, the enemy is not going to let up. He's not going to be lessening his deceptions. He's actually going to be increasing them. And so, friends, what this does is this behooves every one of us to realize the seriousness of the times we are living in and that the most important way um, that we need to be spending our time is spending our time with Jesus. And as we spend our time with Jesus, it is through His Spirit that we are empowered with wisdom to know how to share the gospel with as many people as possible. Because, you know, one of the things about Jesus is, let me ask you, did Jesus love people? Did Jesus make people his priority in his life when he was here on earth? Yes, he did. And that characteristic will be found among his followers, especially in the last days. And so we need to be asking ourselves the question, do we love people the way Jesus does? Do we desire for their salvation? Are we praying for them the way that Jesus did? and even now still does as our high priest in heaven. And so even though the Bible is telling us a time of trouble is coming upon us, let us remember God does not want us to be fearful. And the way that we 
cannot be fearful of what is to come upon us is if we know that we are close to Jesus and we are depending upon Him for every aspect of our salvation, for every aspect of needs that we have, that is how His peace will guard our hearts. Amen? So let's go to question two now. What is the consequence of receiving the mark of the beast? Because as this time of trouble comes upon the earth that the book of Daniel is referring to, we now see in Revelation, because remember we've said many times before, that Daniel and Revelation, they are companion books in the Bible. In other words, you almost have to study them together in order to really get a fuller understanding of what all the different symbols and beasts and all these different things mean. So again, the question, what is the consequence of receiving the mark of the beast? Well, in Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17, we find the answer to that question. So let's go to Revelation 13. Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17. And here the Bible says, He causes all, and it's referring to this beast, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So let's, let's get an explanation here of what's going on. It's telling us here that whoever um, does not receive this mark will not be able to buy or sell. So the lesson here says restrictions on buying and selling are not a new idea. In other words, this type of thing has happened in the past, just not on a global scale. During wartime, rationing was common as a means of restricting what and how much of various products people were able to buy. In addition to a prohibition on buying and selling, Revelation 13, 15, and um, let's see, yeah, what that was, yeah, we read that. Um, Revelation 13, 15, no, we didn't read it. That's what I was thinking, because what it's about to say here. Let's back up a second. Let's read verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Okay, so it says here, in addition to a prohibition or preventing buying and selling, verse 15 says that there will be a time when those who refuse to receive the mark of the beast will be threatened with death and will even be killed. Now again, you know, I preface this by saying this is a serious study. But friends, we need to remember that when Jesus came to this earth, what was his mission? His mission was to come and to provide salvation. And to provide salvation, that meant he knew that even from the moment he was born and he began to grow up and he became a man, he realized that one day he would be dying on the cross for every one of us. And friends, even since the time of Jesus, we need to remember there have been many, many people before us, many followers of Christ who have been willing to give their lives for the cause of the gospel. And friends, I'm just going to sincerely share with you, there will be some of us that God will call to this same level of sacrifice. But again, friends, we don't need to be afraid. You know, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to go and spend some time in Europe. And I remember going to some of the places where the Protestant reformers were, where John Huss and Martin Luther and others. And I remember especially with Huss and others who, you know, remember some of them were burned at the stake and, and other things. But yet, 
that when you read the testimonies of what happened surrounding their deaths, many of them were actually even singing during that time because I believe that they were so filled with the strength and the grace of God that they did not fear death. They didn't fear what was happening because they knew that God has something better for them. And friends, that's what we must cling to. We must remember that, you know, in our own lives, look at every circumstance that God has brought you through in your life. You know, some of us have been through some very, very furnace type experiences. And if you were to tell us before we went through it that we were going to, we would be like, oh no, there's no way. But yet we look and we see how God has brought us through circumstances up until now. And friends, I want to encourage you that the same way God has been faithful to us all of our lives, He will continue to be faithful until the very end. So whatever strength, whatever courage, whatever boldness we need, the Holy Spirit will provide it as long as we keep close to Jesus and we keep our hearts surrendered to Him. So question three, how many people will receive the mark of the beast? In other words, how pervasive is this thing going to be? Well, in Revelation 13, 8, this is a very key verse here, okay? Revelation 13, 8, the Bible says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, speaking of the beast, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So the Bible tells us here that the the distinguishing factor is the ones who will receive the mark are the ones who do not have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. So what does that mean? It means what? We want our names to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life, don't we? So how that comes about is, remember the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever repents, confesses their sins, and decides, yes, I want to follow Jesus all the way. I want to follow Him wherever He tells me to go. That is where our safety is, friends. God tells us that He is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. So friends, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus and you are following in His ways, you are listening for His voice every day, there's no need to fear. Amen? There's another verse in Revelation 7. So let's go back a few chapters to Revelation 7 verses 2 and 3. Okay, and this is another very key verse here. The Bible says, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. You want to write that down in your notes, okay? The phrase, seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So friends, this is, this is actually a beautiful verse here because this is telling us that as the angels are getting ready for what is about to come upon the earth, There is a caution given though, wait, 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 until what? A key thing needs to happen. The seal of the living God needs to occur in the foreheads of those who belong to the Lord. And so let me just read here what the Bible, um, well, the Bible does say this, but what's in the lesson here? It says, the Bible states that only those who remain faithfully committed to Jesus will not receive the mark of the beast. The rest of the people living on the earth, the vast majority, will unfortunately receive that mark. Every person will receive one of two marks, okay? 
And this is what's key right here, friends. There's two different marks, so to speak. One, those who obey and worship the Creator God will receive the seal of God. And friends, that's what we want. We want the seal of God. Those who do not worship and obey the Creator God, they will receive the mark of the beast. So it's two different factors here. We're talking about the seal of the living God and the mark of the beast. So what about this seal of God? Question four says, where is the seal of God placed? Well, right here in Revelation 7, verse 3, let's read it again. Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So what does that mean, on the foreheads? Well, the seal of, the, the seal of God is placed on or in the forehead of the believer, representing that the seal of God will be placed in the mind of the person who receives it. And so let me just go ahead and kind of clarify this. You know, again, a lot of popular thinking and suggestions out there regarding the mark of the beast, when people say in the hand or the head, they think it's something that's going to be visibly seen or visibly done. While the Bible indicates that the seal of God, the mark of the beast, friends, this has more to do with the decisions that we make, okay? We are making a decision either we are going to live for God or we are going to live against God. And if we are living for God, then the Bible tells us that He will seal us. He will place His seal of protection in our minds. So let me read this again. The seal of God is placed on or in the forehead of the believer, representing that the seal of God will be placed in the mind of the person who receives it. Behind the forehead is the frontal lobe, okay, the frontal lobe of the brain. This is the area of the mind responsible for decision making. So, you know, all throughout the day, every second of the day, we are constantly making decisions. And this is the part of the brain where that takes place. So those who receive the seal of God will have made an immovable decision for God. You see, friends, you remember that verse in the book of Joshua that talks about choose you this day whom you will serve? What does choose mean? Choose means I'm making a decision. I'm deciding. Like that old song, I have decided to follow Jesus. Well, where is that happening? That's happening in the mind. We are making a decision for God. So now, what does God write on the foreheads of those who receive His mark or His seal? So the Bible actually does go into a little bit of a description of what this seal of the living God is. Let's go to Revelation 22, verse 4. So that's the last chapter of Revelation, the last chapter of the Bible. Revelation 22, verse 4. And the Bible says, they shall see his face. Oh, friends, aren't you ready to see the face of Jesus, to behold him face to face? And what does it say? And his name shall be on their foreheads. So, friends, what is it that we are sealed with? We are sealed with the name of God. You know, the name of God, remember what does the Bible say? There is no other name under which man will be saved under, except for the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. Revelation 14, 1, let's see what this verse says. Revelation 14, verse 1, and the Bible says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, 
and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. So this is just another verse that shows us that it is the name of God that is written in our foreheads. In ancient times, a seal was used to, and seal as in like a stamp, a seal was used to signify authority and approval. Here we find God writing his name, which represents his character in the minds of the redeemed. Those who receive the seal of God will have the gracious character of Jesus deeply planted in their minds. And so friends, this is, this is so beautiful because this is where every day when we are spending time with Jesus, you know, part of our prayer time with him every day should be, Lord, help me to have your mind. You know, the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So if we want to know, you know, are we really following Jesus? Spend time in his word. Look at how Jesus lived his life. And then look at how you're living your life. See how the two compare. And friends, anytime we find that we are falling short, and let's face it, we do, friends. You know, because of sin, we, we are so filled with weaknesses. But God tells us if we will just come to him with a contrite heart, if we will humble ourselves, that he says his grace is sufficient in our weakness, friends. And so anytime we do see those shortcomings, what those shortcomings do is they just serve to drive us closer to Jesus, amen, to help us realize there's not a moment of the day that we are not safe without the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So let's be pressing the throne. Remember, Jesus invites us when we are in time of need that we are to come boldly before his throne because he sympathizes with our weaknesses. He knows what we are facing. It goes on to say, humanity was originally created in the image of God. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, that perfect image of God was lost. The entire plan of salvation is based on God recreating in human beings the image of God. The hopeful fact is that those who receive the seal of God will have been remade in the image of God through the power of God and the presence of Jesus in their lives. Amen. Isn't that good news? The Mark of the Beast issue sees planet Earth divided into two groups. And see, friends, this is what it comes down to. Because again, you know, when you talk about the Mark of the Beast, the buying, the selling, that itself is not really the issue. It really is coming down to who do we worship? Do we fully, with every aspect of our heart, mind, soul, are we worshiping the Lord Creator God? Or are we falling for some deception that's out there? And so it goes on to say, The Mark of the Beast issue sees planet Earth divided into two groups, one willing to allow Jesus to live in their hearts no matter what the cost, and the other group unwilling to surrender their lives totally to him. And you know, friends, for those of you that have already been going through these studies with me, uh, you've, you've heard me say many times before, and this is for our new friends who are viewing this one for the first time, let us always remember that Jesus never asks us, he never asks of his followers, to do anything that he has not been willing to set the example himself. And so friends, as I stated again at the beginning of this lesson, I think it was around question two, yes, there will be some of us that will be called to, to basically be willing to go through that ultimate sacrifice for the gospel. But we have to ask ourselves, what was Jesus willing to do? What cost did Jesus pay? 
And yes, friends, we know the answer. He was willing to give up everything. And why? Because he loved us. And so, friends, it begs of us to, you know, do a little self-inventory as the Apostle Paul um, encourages us to do, to examine ourselves, to realize how much am I willing to give for Jesus? Am I willing to sacrifice all for the cause of the gospel? So question six here, who does God call us to worship in earth's final days? And you see, friends, that's what the whole book of Revelation, it is centering on this subject of worship. Because remember, when Lucifer was in heaven, before, he, before Satan fell, his name was Lucifer. What was his downfall? He wanted to be in the place of God himself. He wanted all of creation to worship him. And friends, that's what it comes down to in these last days of earth's history is that Satan is seeking to get as many people as possible to worship him instead of worshiping the living God. And friends, we have the privilege to show the world that God is alive and well and he, he is the only one that is worthy of our worship. So Revelation 14, 7 gives a description regarding God. Revelation 14, 7, the Bible says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. So friends, the Bible here in Revelation gives us a description of who God is and what we are to do. The Bible here says, worship him, worship God who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Amen. He is our creator. God's word urges us to worship the creator rather than his created beings. The mark of the beast issue contrast true worship, the worship of the creator God with false worship. Just as Satan attempted to have Jesus worship him in the wilderness. Remember that time when Jesus went into the wilderness and Satan was trying to tempt him. And how did, how did Jesus respond? It is written. It is written, the word of God is our defense against any deceptions the devil may try to put up in front of us. But just as Satan attempted to have Jesus worship him in the wilderness, he seeks to receive the worship of the world before Jesus returns. And friends, I just, I want to stress this for a moment uh, to help us remember you know, Satan has had 6,000 years to be tempting mankind. And one thing that he has attempted to perfect over those 6,000 years is how he deceives us. You know, he doesn't come right out as who he is because then it's obvious of what he's doing, but rather he is becoming much more subtle in his deceptions. He attempts to actually appear as truth when actually he is completely full of lies. And you may be asking yourself the question, well, if he's appearing as truth, how can I know the difference between what is true and what is false? Well, again, friends, that's where our safety is in spending time in God's word. Um, I, I've really been sensing an urgency in my own heart to be spending more and more time in God's Word to know what He says, because the Bible says that when we spend time in His Word, that we will know the shepherd, we will know His voice. And friends, the more time we spend with the Lord in His Word, the more we recognize His voice. And so the more time we spend in truth, then the more obvious it will be when something is not truth. And that's something we take by faith because the Lord tells us he will provide for us what is needed.
It goes on here to say, and in calling us to worship the Creator, Revelation 14.7 quotes directly from the fourth commandment, which calls people to do what? To remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And again, for our new students who are joining, we did a whole lesson um, a few lessons ago about the beauty of Sabbath how the Sabbath is in the heart of God's Ten Commandments, His principles of happiness. And friends, the issue of the Sabbath does center around worship. Who is it we will truly worship? And so question seven, which part of God's law is a special sign of God's authority? Did you know that actually the Sabbath is a special sign that we belong with God. We can find that in Ezekiel 20, verse 20. So let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel is right before um, the book of um, Daniel. So Ezekiel 20, verse 20. Let's see here. Let me turn. Because again, as I'm turning, that gives you time to turn in yours too. Ezekiel 20, 20. And the Bible says, um, it's God speaking, Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. So God is saying here that as we experience Sabbath with Him, as we experience that seven-day cycle of every seventh day coming into His presence and resting in Him, that what that does is it solidifies our own faith in Him, that He is our Creator God, that He is the one who has redeemed us. It's something that He has provided as a wonderful eternal gift for us. And so the lesson here says the Sabbath is a sign or seal that signifies the authority of God calling to mind God's creatorship and His power to recreate. In keeping the Sabbath, a person demonstrates allegiance to the Creator God and full acceptance of His complete authority. So you see, friends, when we experience that Sabbath blessing every week of saying, you know what, God has given me six days to labor, to do the things, that I need to do, but the seventh day, the seventh day belongs to the Lord our God. And it's a 24-hour period that He invites us to come and bask in His presence, to rest and be refreshed and rejuvenated. It is a gift of time that He has given us. So why is the Sabbath called the seal of God? Well, in Exodus 20, verse 11, the Bible says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Ezekiel 20, verse 12 says, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, or between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. We just read that. The seal of God represents God's authority on two levels, as our Creator and as our Redeemer. The Sabbath exists not only as a memorial of creation and of God's creative power, but also as a sign of God's recreative power. Only the Creator has the power to be the recreator. Amen. And friends, um, you know, something to just uh, remember, or maybe uh, this is something you'll realize for the first time, is you remember when Jesus died on the cross, what day did He die on? He died on Friday. And what day did He resurrect on? He resurrected on Sunday. So what day was in between Friday and Sunday? It was the Sabbath. And what did the Lord do? What did Jesus do? He rested in the grave on the Sabbath. And I think even through that, 
that was one of God's ways of calling his people everywhere to remember the Sabbath day, to remember to rest in him. It goes on to say, full surrender to God leads to obedience regarding his commandments. As Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Because remember, friends, it's all about our relationship with him. It's just like in our human relationships here on earth, you know, between a husband and a wife, between a mother or father and their son and daughter. You know, when we have a loving relationship with someone, we want to do what pleases them. We want to do what is helpful to them. And friends, it's like that in our relationship with God. When we realize how much God loves us, that is what causes us to be able to respond in love to Him. And when, when our hearts are in love with God, what do we desire? <clears throat> We want to do whatever pleases Him, whatever is according to His will. So now question nine, who is the beast who has his own mark of authority? <clears throat> so now these next couple questions are going to get into exactly, you know, now what is the mark? Where does it come from? What does it mean? But we first of all, we spent time on the seal because the seal is really where we want our focus to be because the seal of God is what ends up providing the safety and the security that we need. Revelation 13 verse 12. So let's go back. The next couple questions are all going to be in the book of Revelation. So Revelation chapter 13, verse 12. And here the Bible says, And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And if you were with us for our last couple of lessons, that phrase right there, the deadly wound being healed, that's going to ring a bell for you. And so here what it's talking about is in Bible prophecy, a beast is a symbol, you'll remember, to represent a kingdom or a nation. And consistent with the testimony of the Bible, the nation that's being referred to here is Vatican City. Now again, if this is brand new to you, you're going to want to go back to previous lessons. Um, it would be number 17 and 18, uh, the two preceding this one, that you'll want to go back and study that to understand how the Bible basically outlines the identifying marks of who this beast is and all these identifying traits point to what we know as the Vatican City. And we pointed out again in previous lessons, friends, really want to stress this point. This is not talking about individual people. This is referring to a system, to a, you know, an organized system. So keep in mind, no matter where individual people may be, uh, whether they're Catholic, Baptist, Presbyterian, whatever, God sees the heart of every individual person. And you know, something we'll get into in a, in a upcoming lesson is in uh, Revelation 18, 4, you know, God issues a call. He says, come out of her, my people. And I love that verse because what that is, is God is saying, and this he's referring especially to the end of time, that as people begin to understand more and more what truth is versus error, it's as if God is saying, come, come, my people, you belong to me and I want you to be with me. So understand that when it comes to individual people, that God is calling every one of us to come into a closer relationship of truth with him. So now I know another question that comes up a lot when we talk about the mark of the beast is, what about the number? And I guess you probably already know what that number is. It's 666. It's one of those numbers that when people hear it, it's like, ooh, kind of thing. 
But friends, we want to really take this seriously and understand that when the Bible talks about 666, it gives the indication, the Bible says, that it is the number of a man. Um, let's go to Revelation 13. We're actually still here. Verse 18, Revelation 13, 18. The Bible here says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His name is 666. So again, when you compare studying in the scriptures along with historical events and historical studies, the Bible and historical study, studies bring out, it says the number is 666, and 666 is actually not the mark of the beast. It is the number of a man and can be calculated to help identify the first nation of Revelation 13. Some Bible scholars have demonstrated that a title which is given to the Pope from the Vatican City, one of his titles is Vicarious Feli Dei, which that's Latin and that means Vicar of the Son of God. And if you do the Roman numeral calculation of all the letters in that Latin name, all of those letters, numerical values, total up to 666. So, where is the mark of the beast placed? Well, Revelation 13, 16, which we read just a few moments ago, and I'll just highlight it again. He, the beast, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark where? On their right hand or on their foreheads. So what does this mean? The symbol of the hand represents works or actions. You know, in our everyday life, what do we use our hands for? We use our hands to be productive. The forehead represents the mind, where again, we talked about what happens here the frontal lobe, that is where decisions are made. People will demonstrate allegiance to the beast either in their thoughts by agreeing with the agenda of the beast or in their actions by submitting to the beast authority even if they disagree with the authority. So it's either by thought or by action. The mark of the beast is a symbol of allegiance to the false religion of the last days. So then that comes down to what is the mark of the authority of the beast in Revelation 13? And remember we talked a few moments ago about what is the overarching theme in Revelation? It's about worship. Who will mankind worship? Will man worship the true God of heaven or represent or worship um, his enemy, uh, Satan himself. And remember all throughout time, all throughout the scriptures, for every gift, for every truth that God has, what does Satan do? Satan sets up a counterfeit or a deception. And we see this same scenario play out regarding the seal of God or the mark of the beast. And so if you're starting to put things together, this is going to begin to make more and more sense because remember, what did the seal of the living God, what does that relate to? It relates to the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, the day that we are called to worship who? The true God of heaven. So if the seal of the living God and Sabbath worshiping the true God of heaven, if those are tied together, then on the flip side, if you have the mark of the beast, what would be representing that mark on the deceptive side? Well, let me read what the lesson here says. Just as the Sabbath is a sign that represents the authority of God, Sunday is a sign that represents the authority of the church. 
in a couple of quotes um, that come directly from, you know, Roman Catholicism are these. This one is from Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 38. It says, Fundamentalists meet for worship on Sunday, yet there is no evidence in the Bible that corporate worship was to be made on Sundays. The Jewish Sabbath or day of rest was, of course, Saturday. It was the Catholic Church that decided Sunday should be the day of worship for Christians in honor of the resurrection. So again, if this is something you're hearing for the first time, I know you're probably thinking, whoa, what is she talking about? Where is this coming from? Again, I strongly encourage you, friends, go back to our previous lessons. We spent two whole lessons on about the truth of the Sabbath and then how over time the deception of the first day of the week came into play and how all of that uh, came about. And so when you study all of it, it begins to become a clearer picture of what is going on. And so we see, and there's many other places you can go, it's, it's not even something that uh, Roman Catholicism even tries to hide. It's, it's in their writings, it's just a matter of researching it. But it basically comes down to that when we are looking at the issue of worship, friends, we have a decision to make. Are we going to worship the true God of heaven and what he says is true and right? Or are we going to follow the traditions of men? And friends, I know this is, this is not an easy subject. This is not an easy topic to go through. I myself went through a time in my life many years ago where I had to make this very decision in my own life because I was in a path where I was in a, in a Sunday keeping church and I want you to know God worked through that experience to help me grow in Him because everything we experience in life, God can bring about good out of it. Amen? But he brought me to a point of realizing that the gift of the Sabbath was what he wanted me to experience. And so that meant making a lot of changes in my life. But friends, I want to tell you in the years since I've done that, friends, oh, I, I have no regrets at all. I've just continued to fall in love with Jesus more, to know deeply within my heart that He is my Creator, my Savior, my Redeemer. And even now, friends, as we see things unfolding in the world, more and more prophecies unfolding, I see more and more how this issue of worship really is going to become a major part of what happens in the world in the days before Jesus comes. There's a couple more quotes here, but I'm going to go ahead and just uh, kind of come down to our last few questions just for the sake of time. But this time, this next question ties back into, um, again, we spent a whole lesson um, talking about in Daniel 7 verse 25, where the question is, what does the papacy believe it has the power to do? And Daniel 7.25 tells us, And it shall intend to change what? Times and law. The papacy represented in Daniel 7.25 as the little horn has attempted to change God's times and laws. And the key word is attempted because no one can change God's time and God's law. Amen. God's law is eternal forever. But it says it will attempt to, will attempt to create a deception. And so as they've attempted to do this by changing Sabbath observance from the seventh to the first day of the week and by altering the second and the tenth, of the Ten Commandments. In other words, if you go and you look at the Ten Commandments in, um, in a regular version of the Bible versus in a Catholic version of the Bible, you will see that there is a difference um, in those commandments. So question 14, who has the mark of the beast today? 
In other words, does anyone have the mark of the beast right now? Well, Revelation 13, 16, which again, we keep going back to, it says he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark where on the right hand or in their foreheads. It is when this mark is enforced by law that it becomes the mark of the beast. Until that time, nobody will have the mark of the beast. So in other words, in other words, friends, do you ever get tongue twisted sometimes? The Bible is letting us know there is a time coming where there will be laws implemented regarding worship. And friends, we need to make the decision today. Are we going to follow the law of God or the law of man? And again, when we spend time in the word, when we are in that loving relationship with Jesus, it becomes very clear that the seal of the living God, which is what we all desire to have, the seal of the living God is in connection with God's beautiful Sabbath. And friends, if, you, if you're not really familiar with the Sabbath or what that means, I encourage you to go back through our lessons, find the ones on the Sabbath, and just go through those studies and let the Word of God, uh, let the Word of God speak to you uh, for what you need in your life right now. So last two questions. What are the characteristics of those who avoid the mark of the beast? In other words, those who have the seal of the living God, is there something that identifies them, that characterizes them? And that's found in Revelation 14, verse 12, where the Bible says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who do what? Two things who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And remember, friends, when it comes to keeping the commandments, is that something we can do on our own? No, we can't. We need God's Holy Spirit to be living in us, to empower us to be able to do what is right. That is why, friends, when Jesus came, not only did his death count for us, but his perfect life, because remember, Jesus never sinned. So when we accept him into our life, it is also accepting that his perfect life, his righteousness counts in our place. Isn't that good news, friends? When the Bible says that every aspect of our salvation has been provided through Jesus, it means it. And so what is our part? Our part is to respond. Our part is to surrender and say, Yes, Lord, I want, I want in my life what you have for me. So final question for our study right now. What relationship does Jesus have with those who receive the seal of God? So let's close out with Revelation 14.4. It says, These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And the key part that we want to close out with is right in the middle there where it says, These are the ones who do what? Who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And so, friends, just to kind of recap on this lesson of the mark of the beast, I just want to encourage all of us, our focus should not be so much on the mark of the beast as it should be on the seal of the living God. And friends, God has so much in store for us. The Bible says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for us. And so friends, as you continue to study, as you continue to every day on your own, ask that question, Lord, how do I surrender more to you? 
How do I grow more deeply in my relationship with you? I want you to know that if that's the attitude of your heart every day, then God will give you what you need. He will give you wisdom. He will give you courage. He will give you His perfect peace. So friends, until we meet again for our next study, I just encourage you, keep studying God's Word. Keep taking every step of the day with Him. And know that no matter what may be happening in the future, we have no need to fear because we know our God is with us and we know that He will never, ever forsake us. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the beauty and for the power of your word. And Lord, as we've studied this lesson, it does remind us, Lord, we know that we are living in the last days of earth's history. And Lord, we long for the day when Jesus will come in those clouds, when he will shout, and Lord, <laughs> we will be caught up in the air and we will be with the Lord forever. Father, I pray that in the days between now and then that you would continue to teach us, Lord, how to be completely surrendered to you. Help us every day to join with that prayer, Jesus, that you prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done. Father, thank you for being our creator, our recreator. Thank you for being our savior and our redeemer. And thank you that you are a constant refuge, no matter what trouble we may find ourselves in. Lord, help us to never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. But Lord, help us to be faithful by your grace in all circumstances. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, friends, it's been good to be with you to study the word of God. And we will have our next study that actually focuses on the United States and Bible prophecy. That's right. Did you know that the Bible actually does refer to the United States? We'll talk about that next time. So until then, God bless each and every one of you.